Come on, give God a hand clap of praise on today. I'm going to try it again. That might work for me, but come on, give God a hand clap of praise on today. Come on, put some power behind it if you know there's power in his name. Punctuate it with some power. Say it like you mean it. Hallelujah. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is with great joy, excitement, and enthusiasm that we are in fact here because we could be any other place, but God saw fit that we be here in this place, alive, cognizant, aware of our surroundings with the right activity of our limbs, health, breath, life, and strength. Touch somebody and tell them you ought to be glad to be here, not in the hospital, not in the morgue, not in hospice, not not with respiratory failure, not, not in the grave, not in prison, but here, somebody ought to give God some glory that you're here. Come on, put your hands together right where you stand if you're glad to be here in this place. Hallelujah. God is great. Indeed, he is greatly to be praised. And I want to give some recognition and show some love to this awesome and amazing music department. Give it up for them really quickly. Y'all blessed us tremendously. We at the third watch and they still going hard and strong. And, and you know, in, in war, uh, those soldiers have to keep that front line strong until reinforcements come. I thank them until I get here uh, that they keep keep that front line strong until reinforcements come. But, but touch somebody and tell them, help is here now. Oh God, y'all don't hear me in this house. Put your hands together. Hallelujah. Listen to all of our guests who are in this place. We are so grateful to God for your very presence. We're family here at New Direction Church. You're not around bougie people, stuck up people, funny style people, folk that won't speak to you. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them I'm glad to be here with you on the road with you, come on, come on, in the house with you, celebrating God with you, come on, come on, uh-oh, one of them, one of them, two of them might be bougie, they ain't say nothing, turn to the other neighbor and tell them, tell them, let me talk to you then, I'm happy to see you then, come on. Listen, listen, I, I, I want to do this, I want to get right to the word, because we're in this series, Exodus, and I have a lot to share and a short amount of time to do that. Um, this message on today is found in Exodus chapter 31. Uh, but as I was entering into worship, I saw our young people singing. It is Youth Sunday. And uh, come on, give it up for them. I believe the children are the future. We should teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. And give them a sense of pride to make it easier. So, so do me a favor and give it up for those who've worked with our young people on today. Thank God for them. Listen, I, I want you to open up your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 31. And I want to look at verses 1 through 11 on today. To all of our guests who are in the house, um, we thank God for you being in-house and online. Your presence is not taken for granted. We are made the better because you are here. Amen. And when you come to worship, it's not just something for you to get, but there's something for you to give. There's somebody for you to encourage, somebody for you to uplift. And so you've done that already with your presence. Exodus chapter 31, and I want to look at verses 1 through 11. <coughs> when you have arrived, please say amen. amen. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful and thankful for these moments. You have allowed us to be here in your house at this time. God, we don't take for granted all of the wonderful things you've done in our lives. God, forgive us for our many sins and faults and complaints. God, we are grateful that you allowed us to even be here. So God, now that we're here, we ask you would speak to our hearts, to our minds, grow us and develop us, edify us. Take your word, which has already been prepared in private, and God, make it more powerful and practical as it is shared in public. Take what you've shared with me in my private meeting of prayer and study. Impress it upon the hearts and minds of the hearers that we might walk like you, talk like you, think like you, love like you, live lives that are pleasing to you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Exodus chapter 31, beginning at the first verse, here's what it says. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. And he said, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I indeed, I have appointed with him Aholab, the son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I've put wisdom in the hearts of all, somebody say all, all, the gifted artisans that they may make all that I've commanded you, the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the laver and its base, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister as priest, and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place according to all that I've commanded you, they shall do. Today I want to talk about a divine assignment. A divine assignment. Do me a favor and turn to your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, you were put here for a purpose and you have a divine assignment. Amen. You may be seated. The story of the Exodus is so absolutely amazing because what we see is God taking a group of people out of slavery and he forms a nation out of them. While God begins to work on them, he begins to introduce himself to them, helping them to understand really who he is. God doesn't just want them to be people who live a certain way, but he wants them to be people who give a certain way, and he helps them to understand, I've saved you, I've spared you, and I've brought you out for you to render service unto me. The first thing God does is when he brings them out, he lays out in chapter 20 the Ten Commandments. These commandments were given to them to help them understand God's moral standard, his expectations on how they were to live. But in chapter 25, he teaches them how to give. He says, now I want to collect an offering from you all. Watch this. But I want you to collect this offering so that I can build a tabernacle and a place where I have residency among you. The tabernacle, we might also call it the tent of meeting was a place in which God's presence and his Shekinah glory would show up in the most holy place and there God would offer them mercy from the mercy seat. God said, I brought you out of Egyptian bondage. I've set you apart from other people. Now I want to dwell among you, but I need you to build for me a place that will house my presence. And he begins to teach them and tell them how specifications, the tabernacle or temple is to be erected and built. He said, Moses, I want you to see to it that you build it in accordance to the specifications and the architectural design I have laid out for you to follow. And in a real sense, God has given all of us specifications how we ought to build our lives. The Bible is the blueprint. It has the details given to us by God as to how we ought to build our careers, how we ought to build our families, how we ought to build our relationships, how we ought to build our houses. We're to build them in accordance to the blueprint that God has given to us. In fact, Jesus says this, the man or the woman who builds their life upon my word, I'll liken them to a wise man or a wise woman that storms may come and opposition may come and adversity may come, but they will be stable and secure because they built them their lives on the solid rock. And in reality, I believe there's some people in here that the only reason you're still standing is not because you built your life on your career, not because you built it on your pension, not because you built it on relationships, but you built your life on the word of God and that's what's kept you secure, solid, and sound. Save the Lord build a house. They labor in vain who build it. Not only does God give them the architectural designs, 
he tells them, Moses, I want you all to make sure that you build in accordance to the code and the standard I've set for you to build. I've done a few building projects. We've expanded this sanctuary. We've done some renovations at the other property. I've been with others during the process of building. My wife and I built our second home. I've been on building projects. And what you get on a building project is that you get architectural designs. Those blueprints give you the specifications as to how you are to build. When the architect makes the blueprints, then the blueprints are taken to the city and the state for approval. Once they approve your building, project you then have to make sure you follow the code and the specifications that they've given to you then they give you an inspector who comes to make sure that you build in accordance to the layout to the code and the standard they've set for you because they're the ones who give you the grade can I tell you that God is not just the architect God is also the authority who gives us the permit as to what we can build then God is the one who inspects what we build to make sure what we are building is in accordance with him. Make sure the relationships you build are in accordance to his word. Make sure the name you're trying to build for yourself is in accordance to his word. Make sure the family you're trying to build is in accordance to his word because God is the one that's going to give you the grade. Hold on. Wait a minute. God is not just the one who tells them how to build. God's the one who tells them why to build. Because here's what you got to understand. God gives us our why. And if you don't come to God and get your purpose from him, life won't make sense to you. Because God is the one who gives us our mission, our purpose, and helps us understand why we are to live the lives in accordance to his word, what we are to focus on, and what our mission should be. Hear me loud and clear. God is the one that gives you your purpose. He tells Jeremiah, before I formed you in the belly, I knew your name. I had a purpose and a plan for your life. Before people had an opinion, I had a purpose. Before people put their mouths on you, I already had a purpose. Can I insert this real quick right where I stand. It doesn't matter what your past is. God still has a purpose and a plan for your life. In fact, God will use your past to tie into your purpose. So ultimately, it all works together for his good. Every tear you've cried, even the mistakes you made, even the setbacks you endure, God will use your past and still work with you in the present to get you to your future. Is there anybody up in this house who's grateful to to God that he looks beyond your faults still supplies your needs still is up to something in your life despite what you've said despite what you've done touch somebody on your row and tell them you still got purpose you know how I know you got purpose cause look at your handprint no two handprints are alike every single human being on earth even twins have their own individual identity and handprint. That means there's something specific for you to do, something specific for you to build, something specific for you to work on. Your, your personality, your experiences, everything you've gone through, God is still up to something in your life. In fact, when God brought Israel out and he's speaking to the congregation now, he calls Bezalel out from among them and he tells Bezalel, your best days are not behind you. Your best days are still ahead of you. In fact, I delivered you and saved you because I'm up to something in this season of your life. I believe he was an older man. I believe he was more mature but when God gives him the purpose he helps him understand that I'm still up to something in your life I came to tell some 40 year olds some 50 year olds some 60 year olds some 70 year olds God is still up to something in your life you still got wisdom to offer you still got advice and insight to give you got experience we ain't had you got something to offer to God and to this world I thought I had more people of purpose up in this house touch somebody next to you and tell them get ready because your best work is ahead of you get ready because God is getting ready to do a new thing saith the Lord is there anybody here who just believe God spared you saved you delivered you brought you out because he's still up to something in your life holler back at me if you hear me in this house he 
says, I'm giving you something specific. But then I'm giving you something significant. Because they had built the monuments in Egypt. They had built the king's tombs. They had built the sphinx and the pyramids of Giza. In fact, in Egypt now, the architectural designs and structures are still modern wonders of our world. They had built all of these elaborate uh, monuments and structures. But God said, I've got something more significant for you to do in this season. I want you to use the experience and the exposure you got in Egypt. Now I want you to use that and build a tabernacle. I want you to use the gifts, the talents, and the abilities I've given you. And now I want you to use them for building me a house for my glory. Perhaps Basilel, who was a former slave, thought that all of his work was for nothing that perhaps they were laboring and building all of these structures in Egypt. But deep down, he knew there was something greater. And it wasn't until God brought them out that God began to show him more significant things. He had gifts, talents, and abilities that were laying dormant on the inside of him and his most significant work was ahead of him. God was calling him to use his time, his talent, and his treasure to build for him a house and contribute toward his kingdom. I want somebody in here to understand. God didn't just put you here to go to your job, nine to five, clock out, purchase materials, keep doing it over and over again in terms of mundane working. God has something more significant for you to contribute to and that's the kingdom of God. God wants you to use your time, your treasure, and your talent, not just in the secular, but he wants you to use it in the sacred because God is not coming back for universities. He's not coming back for corporations. He's not coming back for institutions. He's coming back for a church without a spot or a wrinkle and only what we do for Christ will last. Everything else will fade. God shouldn't have to pry or pull you to give back to him. After all, he's the one that gave you what you got. Basilel, you wouldn't have the gift if I ain't give it to you. You wouldn't have the resources if I didn't give them to you. You wouldn't have the knowledge if I didn't give it to you. Now that I gave it to you, I want you to give a portion back to me now I'm going to come down your row but is there anybody here who knows everything you got the Lord gave you what you know the Lord taught you where you are the Lord brought you so I don't have a problem lifting up my hands I don't have a problem serving in ministry I don't have a problem offering God an offering after all God is the one that got me entrance into the university God is the one that got me the application for the job then God is the one that told them give me the job then God gave me the health to go to the job draw my check give something back have I got anybody here who won't think, wait until Thanksgiving to give God some thanks open up your mouth and put a praise on it right there God didn't have to pry pull or beg he said I'm the one gave you everything you have. Let me give this to you. Chapter 25, he tells them how to give because God wants to make you get this not just a consumer but a contributor. In fact, we need to stop asking God just to bless us but God make me a blessing. God, I want a ball so big. Oh, this is too much for y'all. I thought I had some folk. God, I want, I want you to bless me indeed. Enlarge my territory that I'm the answer to somebody's prayer. Enlarge my territory that I open up doors instead of knocking on them. Enlarge my territory so I'm the lender, not the borrower. Holler back at me if you believe God want to stretch you. We see the design. Let the church say design. Then number two, look at the diversity. Let the church say diversity. Here's where I want to get you. Watch this. Notice I had you read verse 1 through 11 because God says, I have given them all. Multiple times you'll see that term all. I've given them the gift to work in all manner of workmanship. I've 
taken artisans and sculptors and painters and seamstress and all of those who are craftsmen. I want all of them to use all of their gifts. I don't want just a few people working on the tabernacle. Yes, Moses has his job, but Bezalel, you got a different lane. You may not be able to sing like her, preach like him, operate like that one, but God didn't leave you empty handed. I want all of y'all using all of what I gave you. I want you to take your gifts and I want you to offer them to me. I want you to render unto me some service. He calls all of them in the congregation to use all of their gifts. Can I tell you God doesn't just give us natural gifts. God gives us spiritual gifts and all of us have a responsibility and a part and a role to play in the church. If the church is not functioning at full capacity we are partially paralyzed but wonder could we do more work if all of us use our gifts and talents wonder the impact we could make from 38th to 34th street if all of us came together wonder what type of impact we could make from 38th street to 56th if all of us use our gifts for the glory of God now I need all of y'all to put a praise on it right there Here's why I love it. I love it because, notice this, God said, I want you all, don't miss this, to use your gifts, your talents, and your abilities. And I want you to use them for my work. In fact, watch this, Basilel is the one who we see the name the most. But there were all of the people who shared, watch this, all of them had a trade and a skill. This is what I want to help you on today. Because they got this job because all of them had a trade or a skill. I am a proponent for higher education. The Bible says in all you're getting, get knowledge, get wisdom, get understanding. I, I'm graduating in December, December the 14th with a master's in Christian leadership. 2020, I start a doctoral program. I'm a proponent for education, but I'm also a barber by trade. I've made my living by being a barber by trade because skills pay the bills. While you get education, also add to your repertoire. Make yourself more marketable because God has a prepared place for a prepared person. If you prepare yourself, God will give you promotion. If you prepare yourself, he'll open up a position because the only reason Bezalel got the job is because he had prepared himself to do the job. Ain't no need getting mad and jealous with other people when they start operating in their lane and God start blessing them for them training themselves getting certification getting educated don't get mad at other people instead of you surfing the internet you need to be going to some symposiums going back to class turn your car into a classroom educate yourself more than you entertain yourself and God will elevate you do I have a witness up in this place touch somebody and tell them I got an assignment I ain't got time to be caught up in drama I I ain't got time to be arguing with people. I ain't got time to be in your mess. I ain't got time to be social and social media. I've got a divine assignment. If you got an assignment up in this place, holler to the top of your lungs. God is up to something. They have skills. Can I go deeper? We see people come to the United States from all over the world. South America. Haiti other places and I ain't knocking none of them in fact respect game I ain't knocking none of them they come in neighborhoods dilapidated buildings they'll go into those buildings they'll operate at a low budget they ball on the budget they'll buy a whole bunch of stuff that depreciates they invest in something that builds and expands and before you know it they got two and three and four then they bring their cutting them over here set up shop with them then we sitting back mad y'all don't want to talk back to me now but you went oh god i feel like digging up in this place i wish i had some folk with a divine assignment i wish i had some people up in here who believe god is getting ready to raise up some people who don't think like folk used to think, who don't operate like people used to operate, who don't squander their resources, who focus on what God called them to do. Holler back if you hear me in this place. 
He said, Bezalel, I want you, I want all of y'all to use all of your gifts and build my tabernacle. It's not only multiple craftsmen, it's master craftsmen. Okay, it's not only individuals who could do the job, it's individuals who could do the job well. In other words, these weren't the fellas that were sleeping class. The Bible says, underline it again, they had wisdom. They had understanding. They had knowledge. They had applied themselves at the level they were already at. That's what opened up the door for them to do this special work. Because when you apply yourself at the level you are at, it's only a matter of time God elevates you and the people who are over you and the people you work with may not celebrate you now don't focus on them you do your job to the best of your ability because God will not forget your labor of love and other people may not celebrate you or pat you on the back but God is watching your work and he's watching your ways because if God can get certain stuff out of you Joseph while work you at the level at Potiphar's house it's only a matter of time you become prime minister I want to see what you're going to do at the lower level I want to see are you going to do it with a smile or are you going to complain about it the whole time I want to see if you're going to do it when you feel well and when you don't feel well are you going to be consistent because if I get consistency out of you I can consistently keep on blessing you is there anybody up in this house who knows God is up to something when people ain't patting you on your back when people ain't celebrating you when people ain't back in your play, God will still bless you. Make some noise in this place. Okay, let me give this to y'all. This, this way it gets me. Um, it says, they did what they did well. Okay, that means they didn't have a that'll do mentality. That's good enough. How much can I get away with? They did what they did well. Scripture says, do everything you do as unto the Lord. That everything you do, don't look to get recognition from men. Do what you do to give glory to God and thanks to God for giving you the gift. God, I'm just grateful. You gave me the strength to do it, the skill to do it, the artistic ability to do it, the insight to do it. I can't stand people who don't have a spirit of excellence, shoddy work, then get mad when you talk about their shoddiness. No, raise your standards up. Quit doing sloppy, shoddy work, thinking God is going to bless your mess. God don't bless mess. God bless excellence. I love this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. MLK said this. He said, you should do what you do so well that the dead, the unborn, and the living couldn't do it better. You should do what you do so well as a way to show God honor that he gave you the gift. Touch somebody and tell them be a master. Master your craft. Work at it until you perfect it. Work at it until your name is called. Work at it until you get more engagements. Work at it until you get a promotion. Work at it until you get a raise. Work at it until you become a professional. Don't be content being an average. Don't be content being an amateur. Master Master what you do, and I promise you the master will bless you for it. I'm a barber by trade. I told y'all that 15 years old, I went to a barbering school at 46 in Arlington, Kenny's Barbering Academy. And I was the youngest barber at that time in the state of Indiana. And when I enrolled in barbering school, I'm in, I'm in barbering school with guys with 18, 19, 20, some guys in their 30s, guys 50, families, all of that stuff. And some of these guys were ahead of me. They were not only more skilled, they're more experienced, and they were more mature. And so when I did my cuts early on, they would laugh at my haircuts and joan on them. Okay, Jonan, that's, that's, that's an urban colloquialism in the Midwest. They laughed and mocked my stuff. I made up in my mind to use that pain from them laughing at my stuff 
to fuel my passion to learn and master what I did. So I'd sit in a chair next to the best barbers. I'd watch them the entire time they cut. I'd stand up even when they turned their back to look at their techniques. I'd watch how they lined up their customers. I'd watch their skills and abilities. And after a while, I not only got as good as them, I got better than them. I opened up my own salon called The Master's Touch on 25th and Arlington. Because I wanted people to know when you get service from Sullivan, you dealing with a master. You ain't messing with no rookie. I wish I had some people in here who still believe in excellence. Be excellent in what you do. I don't care if you're a street sweeper. I don't care if you're serving folks at Wendy's. I don't care if you're working at Macy's. Do it with a smile. Do it with a spirit of excellence. Have I got a witness up in this place who knows you got to have an excellent skill? These guys mastered what they did, and they did it so well. God gave them a divine assignment. God said, you guys have built these ancient architectural structures in Egypt. Now I want you to build something more significant. I brought you out because I got a purpose and a plan in mind for your gifts and your skills. What you all build will be a testimony the tabernacle will stand as a testimony to God what my excellency looks like, what my glory looks like. I am a God of order. That's why I'm having you separate the holy place from the most holy place. Then I'm having you separate the, to the area for the Gentiles from the Jewish people. Then I'm going to have the table of showbread. Then I want the lampstand to burn a special kind of oil and incense because this is glory and honor to me. And then I want you to use the finest threads and silk to make the veils that separate the rooms in the temple because when people look at what you built for me I want them to recognize I'm a holy God I'm a God of excellence I'm a God of standards I'm a God of glory I'm not shoddy in fact I want the priest to be so sharp that the robes you put on them are also overlaid with a vest that has an onyx and beryl and has all of these precious stones like sapphire because when people see your work it ought to be a witness to the world to the glory and the excellency of your God y'all got to excuse me this is why when I come to worship I go hard in worship after God saved me delivered me changed me brought me out the least I can do is give God the absolute best I got if you gave your job 40 hours shame on you to come sit up stale with a sullen look on your face and God bless you to be up in here in worship shame on you not to have some excitement have I got some people up in this house who know I got to give God my best my best praise my best worship my best attention when the word go forth have I got help up in this house holler if you hear me if you know you got to give God your best okay here it is here it is I'm on dig 11:30. I'm on dig here it is Point number one, we see the design. Let the church say design. Point number two, we see the diversity. Let the church say diversity. Point number three, we see the dedication. Let the church say dedication. Because now they got the assignment. When they got the assignment, they got it with excitement. Because now God is going to use us to build him a house. We are flattered that God would even accept something from us we're excited that now we get to use everything we learned in Egypt and we get to use it for something greater God we're just excited so they set out with a sense of excitement there's a song that says Lord I'm available to you and in there they say you gave me my hands and you gave me my voice and you gave me everything I have so I'm giving it back to you everything you want out of me God I'm available unto you and they did it with a sense of excitement they were excited about it because they knew 
that what they built was a way to worship God for having given them what they had. Walk with me and think with me for a moment. They used their hands to worship. They may have not been praise worshipers or leaders who waved their hands. They were craftsmen who used their hands masterfully to build this tabernacle. In other words, they said, God, our work is a way to worship. We want to ascribe worth to you. That's what worship means. It means that give God the best and what he's worth. So they use their work as a way to worship because they understood. God, you gave us our hands to even use and work to build. Then on top of what they had, the Bible says God gave them an anointing. I promise you, God, when you give him your gifts, God will maximize your gifts and use them greater than you ever thought he could use them. They're using their talents as a way to worship. But hold on, their work was also a way to witness because God said build the tabernacle so that when all the neighboring nations and the idolaters and all of those who were in worshiping idols see what you built to me, there'll be no mistake as to who the true living God is. So I want your work to be a witness. Can I help somebody in here on today? Stop complaining about the fact you're working with people who ain't saved. Stop talking about the fact you dealing with demons on your job. You are the salt of the earth. So God had to sprinkle you in some areas that needed some seasoning. God had to sprinkle you in some areas that needed your salt. God wants your light to shine in some dark places. Let your work be a witness and say I'm going to be the first one show up on time. I'm going to do my work the way I'm supposed to. I'm not going to be in the lunchroom praying over people because they ain't paid me to pray. They paid me to work. I'm not going to over spiritualize this. Call my manager a devil. Call my boss a devil. No, you let your light so shine that men might see your good work and glorify the Father. Have I got a witness up in this place? Touch somebody and tell them your work is a witness. It's a witness. Let me go deeper than that. Because this is not just secular work. This is sacred work. And they gave it their best. Sometimes we have a mindset of this is church. And we don't give God our best. Some of us give more attention to secular environments. And we fail to recognize there's a certain standard you need in handling the holy things of God. You ought to have the right spirit. You ought to have the right mindset. You ought to keep some fresh appreciation. You ought to come in energized. You ought to be glad because David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. You ain't obligated to sing. God blessed you to sing. You ain't obligated to serve. God bless you to serve. And the more God can get out of you, I believe he'll let you live a little bit longer. The more God can pull out of you, I believe he's going to stretch your days. I'm sorry. I'm going to mess with some folk up in here. God didn't leave you around here to be selfish he left you around here to serve and the more service he can get out of you the more he'll do in your life they did it with excitement can I get this to you and I'm about to close they did it with excellence because they recognize that our work is our witness that when the world sees what we constructed for Yahweh. When the world sees what we built for Jehovah, when the world sees uh, the artistic designs, it's not just work, it's theology. Because when they see all of these things that have laid out in the tabernacle, it will show them that God is separated from man. But when we offer up the sacrifices on the altar and the glory and Shekinah comes down, it will help them understand that we're sinners who only been saved by the grace and the mercy of our God. It's not just work we are doing. It's preaching to the
the world. It's witnessing to the world that when they look at us, they ought to see we operate a little bit different. When they look at us, they ought to see victorious on our personality. When they look at us, they ought to see joy in our hearts. When they look at us, they ought to see a standard of excellency. When they see we are set apart, it ought to show them who our God is, that our God is big, that our God is great, that our God is excellent. Oh, excellent. How excellent is our God, that our God is other on a whole nother level. I'm getting ready to land this plane, but if you're not too mean or bougie, will you stand on your feet and testify so that the people on your road know you serve a mighty awesome God. You serve an excellent God. You serve a God who's high and lifted up and he's worthy to be praised. I dare you to rise, shine, and give God some glory. If you are a temple, if you are a vessel, if he's designed you, you don't need an instrument. Open up your mouth and let it roar. Give God a praise up in this. I'm sorry. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I got to lift my hands. I got to give him glory. I got to give him praise. Is there anybody here who will magnify the Lord with me? Let us exalt his name together. you to get this and I'm closing I promise you they built the tabernacle in seven months don't miss this this is a moment I want to get this in your spirit stay standing right where you are for seven months they built the tabernacle don't miss this seven months they built it and completed it 300 years later Solomon would build a temple the same furniture they built in Exodus chapter 31 was the same furniture that was transferred to the temple. 300 years it stood the test of time because when you do good work, it goes beyond your lifetime. You ought to do work so well that when you are dead and gone, people are singing your song. Ooh, we hate that Chanel left. Ooh, we mad that Kevin moved on. Ooh, if we could get him back. God, I ask that you would do with New Direction 50 years after I'm dead and gone. Kids are still getting scholarships out of this church. Neighborhoods are still being fed. Families are still being blessed because we got a divine assignment. If you are in agreement with me, put your hands together. Give God some glory. Tell somebody, tell them God is up to something. And it's bigger than you. And it's greater than you. And it's beyond you. But he wants it out of you. I'm, I'm gone while you're standing. Let me give y'all this. A year ago, this time, I was in Rome, Italy. And we had, we had um, some individuals who go to a Catholic church who had our 10 o'clock service. They made it known that they were Catholic. I said, wow, they ought to love this message today. A year ago, we went to Rome, Italy. While there, we went to the Vatican. The Vatican is where the Sistine Chapel is. In the Sistine Chapel, there are mosaics and frescoes. These amazing paintings that were done by Michelangelo. The amazing thing is Michelangelo was a sculptor. But the Pope called him to do this divine assignment. He said, Michelangelo, I know it's in you. Reluctantly, he decided to paint the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel lays out the themes of the Bible and theology and God's salvific plan from Genesis to Revelation. It, it tells the story of Jesus and redemption. He did this work in 1501. Today in 2019, 20,000 people a day come and look at the work he did that goes to the glory of God. He did it 15 hours a day. In fact, Michelangelo, from the paint that fell from the ceiling, it left him blind in his left eye because he had to stand upright as he painted the ceilings and left him with a hunchback as he left the working site. But he gave 
all he had to God. Don't let everybody else use you but God. Don't let Billy have you and Larry have you and Junie have you. Oh, y'all ain't talking back to me. Don't, don't give your energy everywhere else and so-and-so have your mind. Give some to God. All over the building, stand on your feet. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. God has called all of us, individually and corporately, to use our lives for his glory. God is building something in the earth. He's up to something. But God needs you to make yourself available. I share this over and over again. I'm telling you, the only reason I'm here today is because I was available. If you're going to be used by God, it's not always going to be comfortable. When you're used by God, people use you. But God is a God who says, I am going to reward you for giving yourself to me and allow me to use you for something greater than yourself. And the scripture says the entire congregation were called by God to give themselves to him so he could build them, he could shape them into not only just making a tabernacle for him, but he would make them into tabernacles. God wants to dwell in your heart. He wants to dwell in your thoughts. He wants to dwell in your plans. He wants to dwell in your focus. He, he wants your motives for living. He wants your purpose. He wants to alter how you think, your destiny. He's got a divine assignment for you, but you got to make yourself available to him. Do me a favor, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that Jesus tabernacled among us, came to where we are to save us, to change us. Now, he wants to live in your heart, in your mind. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not saved, you're not born again. You're not a Christian. You need to get his set of blueprints so you can build your life in accordance to his word. Maybe you're saved, you're a Christian, but you need to be in a place where you can be taught, where you can be edified, where you can receive instructions as to how to build your life in this season. If that's you and God has spoken to you, come on, we already see it. Here's what I believe. I believe God is speaking to someone else. I believe God is speaking to someone else. Someone else, you're here today. And you know it's time for you to surrender yourself to God. If that's you and you're here today and it's time for you to give your heart to him, your life to him, to be born again or unite with the church, I want you just to raise your hand right where you are. Raise your hand right where you are. If that's you, if that's you, if that's you just lift it up. We got volunteers who are going to come and get you. They're going to come and receive you. Come on. Come on, this is men. God saving men. Come on. God saving men. God saving men. Listen, I believe God is speaking to someone else. I believe God is speaking to someone else. If you're hearing God is speaking to you, matter of fact, I want y'all to help me turn to your neighbor and tell him, do you need me to go with you? I'll walk with you. Now turn to your other neighbor. Tell them, do you need me to go with you? I'll walk with you. That's all they need. That's all they need. Look at this. Look at this. Mother still got to work. Mother still got a purpose. God still got a plan. Come on. Come on. God is up to something. God is up to something. We're going to let her stay right there, right there, right there. Look at this. Come on. Come on. 